Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Dean's Public Engagement Lecture Series. Today we are unusually fortunate to have with us uh, in the building again, he's uh, been here before, as you will see, uh, Chief Justice Lloyd Carmeier, the Chief Justice of the Illinois Supreme Court, uh, and thus the highest ranking member of the Illinois judiciary. Chief Justice Carmeier is a double Illini, earning both his uh, Bachelor of Science degree here in 1962 and his JD degree uh, in 1964. And you might wonder, well, how can there only be two years in between those? Well, back then they, they did a lot of stuff like that. <laughs> so the world has changed. Uh, and his work and career uh, are greatly admired and uh, closely followed by our students, by our faculty, and by our alumni. After graduating uh, from this law school, Chief Justice Carmeier served as a law clerk at the very court he now heads in the chambers of Illinois Supreme Court Justice Byron O. House. He then served as a state's attorney of Washington County, Illinois. Uh, went from there to work uh, for a year in the chambers of United States District Court Judge James Foreman. He also uh, practiced law at the firm of uh, Holt, House, DeMoss, and Johnson for many years before serving as resident circuit judge of Washington County from 1986 to 2004, at which time he was elected to the Illinois Supreme Court and he became the 120th Chief Justice of that great court in 2016. He's the recipient of innumerable uh, awards for his distinguished service to the bench, the bar, his alma mater, and his community. He was named Citizen of the Year in his hometown of Nashville, Illinois in 2006, uh, where another great jurist, my former boss and mentor, U.S. Supreme Court Justice Harry A. Blackman was also born. Uh, he received the Harold Sullivan Award for Judicial Excellence from Illinois, the Illinois Judges Association in 2010, and the Joseph Bartolak Award uh, from the Lawyer's Assistance Program in 2015. The following year, he was named Chicago Lawyer Magazine's Person of the Year, and perhaps most importantly, uh, the College of Law here conferred upon him the Distinguished Alumnus Award uh, in 2006. His topic for today the continued, if not increasing, significance of state courts in our country's legal system could not be more timely nor more important. In law school and in the headlines, we often tend to obsess about federal institutions, the President, Congress, the U.S. Constitution, the U.S. Supreme Court, and these institutions are fundamental to be sure. They set the broad outlines within which state laws and regulations must operate. That's an implication of the Supremacy Clause, of course. But it is in the midst of these outlines, rather than at their edges, where we often uh, are discussing things, that most law and most life take place. Even today, with all the momentous struggles going on in Washington, D.C., the vast majority of the legal rules, norms, conventions, and practices that govern our daily lives in the most meaningful ways, whether it's education uh, regulation and finance, family law, criminal law, property law, contract and tort law, consumer law, and the like, derive from state constitutions, state statutes, and state regulations and are adjudicated and given, given life and meaning in the state rather than the federal courts. So having someone like Chief Justice Carmeier with us to offer his insights on the state judiciaries based on his decades of work in both the state and federal systems and from his vantage point as the Chief Judicial and Administrative Officer of the Illinois Courts is a real and rare treat and a perfect example, to my mind, of what this lecture series, which is designed to bring the legal academy a bit closer to the bench, the bar, and the legal and related professions, is all about. So with that, please join me in welcoming Chief Justice Carmar back to the place where he began his illustrious career. It's been a long time since I've been in this room. I think Moot Court was out it's the next room, yeah. Okay. There is still a Moot Courtroom down there. Okay, I was there. I was scared to death. <laughs> Thank you, Dean, for that kind introduction. It's a privilege. It really is a privilege for me to be here with you all today, and I had the opportunity earlier to meet with uh, Professor Salz's Illinois Constitutional Law and Policy uh, class, and I assumed then that everyone would be dressed in suits and ties here today, <laughs> like we were. Exactly. You know. 
The other thing, one thing I observed to that class, there were two young ladies in the class with the other young gentleman. I said that was the sum total of a number of women in my entire law school class, and that's changed and has changed for the better. <clears throat> I got down to Champaign early. I, I came from Chicago. Uh, we were at a uh, judicial conference yesterday, um, and the, the theme of the conference was strategic planning. And we had an expert in from uh, the, uh, the now senior status uh, chief judge from uh, the District of Columbia, Judge Washington, um, Mary McQueen, the president of the National Center for State Courts. And we had an all-day symposium on how do we plan for the future given the changing uh, demographics of uh, not only the practice of law but of what's going on in the courts. <clears throat> and I intentionally left Chicago a little early so I could get and be able to drive through the campus. Last year I missed homecoming because I was being sworn in as Chief Justice right after that, and so I, I wasn't here at all. And I was amazed at what's going on in the campus, especially, you know, Green Street, I couldn't get through, and all of the new buildings. By the way, we're going to be, the court is going to be holding a session of uh, oral argument at the Cranard Center. Um, I'm, I'm not sure the date yet, but it's the second week of term. March 15th, uh, professor says. We'll probably select two cases to hear, and, and uh, we've, had, we've had good um, feedback on that. Last year we did it at Benedictine University up in the Second Circuit uh, the year before, a couple of years before we went to Ottawa, Illinois. And many years ago we came down to my district, the Fifth District uh, Courthouse is the only courthouse that's still in existence and being used that Abraham Lincoln practiced in. So we've got a lot of history, and I shared that with the class here. I'm not going to do that with all of you about the history of growing up in a small town. I was going, as I was reading about the dean, um, I didn't realize that he had clerked for Justice Harry Blackman, who was born in Nashville. And I will tell you one little story about Justice Blackman. In 1987, on the 200th anniversary of the U.S. Constitution, I don't know if you were clerking for No, I forgot that. Okay. He, uh, the, the eighth grade class in our public school wanted to do something special to commemorate the 200th anniversary of the Constitution. And they said, well, let's invite Justice Blackman. And he came in response to their uh, invitation. And the, the business and professional community put on a dinner, and I was the MC for that in the evening. And then we all went out to the grade school and... Um, the grade school was filled, the gymnasium was filled, and you could hear a pin drop as he talked. And he finished his remarks by saying something like, the Constitution will go on for another 200 years, and on, and on. And the only blight in the evening is someone yelled murder in response to Roe versus Wade. The Secret Service came around. and uh, But then the next morning, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a judge at that time, he comes walking through the uh, halls of the uh, little courthouse we have in Nashville, Illinois, and he said, you know what I remember best about Nashville are the smells. And I'm thinking, I wonder what that would be. He said, I, I grew up visiting my grandmother. Every, she, he was born there. His mother lived in Minnesota, but he came to, she came to Illinois to deliver to be with her family. And they lived in one of the big houses right down from the mill, and so you had the smells of the mill. He said, it reminds me of when I went to work for Justice House at the Supreme Court. His office was above the bakery, and we had the beautiful smells every morning. Uh, Otto Gussler came in at 2 o'clock and started up the, you know, so that, those are some of my memories. But coming, and very briefly, coming back to uh, Champaign, uh, memories flooded back uh, uh, for me. Um, and I started to think, I, I don't want to talk about what happens in the community and the fact that I had a blind date and I've been married to her for 52 years now and all of those things. <laughs> but uh, that all happened here at Illinois. I, I, I remember a professor that we affectionately referred to as Charlie the Cop Bowman. Very, uh, very big in the criminal law, in fact, very much involved with the, as I understand it, with the drafting of the then new criminal code of 1961. And I'm starting law school in 1960, 61 rather. And so that was a big deal. And then, of course, the Code of Criminal Procedure of 1963. And we thought everything's new and everything's taken care of. Well, now it's, what, 50-some years later, and uh, it's still there. And we had a new professor in criminal law there. And I wonder whatever happened to him, uh, Wayne Lefebvre. 
<laughs> yeah, and, and I stopped by here a few years ago and I visited with him, but he was brand new when I was here. And he's made quite a name for himself, as a lot of people from Illinois have had. So I, I cherish my education not only from the undergraduate school, but from the law school here. And I, I'm, I'm a proud graduate of Illinois. You know, a month ago or so ago when Dean asked me the title of my, it was Dean Turner, assistant dean, asked the title of my speech and a brief description of what I planned to say, I, I thought back and I said, you know, when I was a student here, I didn't plan a month or so ahead, especially for class assignments. But I'm on the Supreme Court now, and I, and I understand we have to do that. You've got to get the programs printed, and the dean wants to make sure. And then I looked up the dean, and I see more about him. Uh, constitutional law expert, I think, wait a minute, maybe I should change my topic, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not going to be good. But this is my alma mater, and you have this uh, dean from Yale. Has he ever mentioned that? <laughs> Does he ever lead you any drinking songs? <laughs> um, but, you know, law students and faculty are usually a pretty tough audience, uh, so um, I saw them packing lunches outside. I'm wondering what the real reason you're here, and that's good, I, I'll have one too. <laughs> So I thought, you know, I better make the, uh, the topic uh, something suitably impressive and academic, and I thought, if it seems substantial enough, perhaps some of your professors would give you extra credit for attending here. Is that happening to anyone? No, it doesn't look like it. Well, the pressure's off then. I don't have to be that good. The message today that I want to share with you is really a, a fairly simple one. It's that state courts matter, and they matter a great deal. And the dean alluded to some of that. That was so when our nation was founded. And for all the attention focused generally on federal courts today, the state courts still do matter. By the way, are there any federal judges here? <laughs> oh, good. Then I can, I can tell you. They get the glamour. We do all the work. <laughs> that was a line would have gotten out. But I'm going to do something a little different than what I normally do uh, with, a, with a speech. I, I, my, my remarks, I have topics as guidelines. But I think uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to tell you what the topic is as I get into it. Hopefully that will help any of you who may be taking notes or critiquing my, my presentation. Uh, and also, if you happen to lose interest in one topic, maybe if I announce a new one, you'll come back to me for a while. So here we go. My first point is this. State courts were the main repository of judicial authority in the United States. To fully appreciate the importance of state courts in the federal system, the first thing you need to remember is we were here first. When the Constitutional Convention convened in Philadelphia in 1787 to decide what the federal government would look like, there was no permanent national judiciary. The closest we had to that was something they called the Court of Appeals in, case, in Cases of Capture, and that was authorized as part of Congress's war powers under the Articles of Confederation to resolve prize cases, that is, cases pertaining to the capture of enemy commercial vessels and cargoes on the high seas. By contrast, an established system of state courts had long been in place. The administration of justice had always been considered integral to the government of the various colonies, and some colonial courts had been in operation for well over a century by the time of the Constitutional Convention. There are indeed records of court proceedings in Massachusetts dating back to 1631. The courts of Maryland were so prolific that their proceedings prior to independence filled some 257 printed volumes. That's prior to the Declaration of Independence. So it was the colonies and, and then the states that served as the basic source of judicial authority in the United States. Delegates to the Constitution, the Constitutional Convention, that is, recognized the need for an established national judiciary, along with a national legislature and an executive branch. But there was no real sense of what the national court would, that the national court would supplant the existing state courts. To the contrary, federal courts were conceived as having a limited role with respect to the exercise of judicial power. The entire judicial power claimed by and for the United States itself fits into a few paragraphs of Article III, cases arising under the Constitution or federal law, admiralty cases, cases against the United States or between citizens of different states, controversies between states, cases involving ambassadors and treaties, and some others. Moreover, 
In the beginning, the entirety of the federal judicial power was vested in a single court, the Supreme Court. Article III did make provision for, and I quote, such inferior courts as the Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. But there's nothing in the Constitution that compelled Congress to set up lower federal courts. While it ultimately did so, those courts were created, were created and now exist purely as a matter of legislative discretion. They, have, they are not rooted in the Constitution. And I think there's a reason for that. When the boundaries of federal power were being debated, there was opposition to creating inferior federal courts at all. Some thought that the existing state courts were fully adequate to decide where, whatever controversies might arise and that federal interests would be sufficiently protected so long as provision was made for state judgments effect, affecting matters of federal concern to be reviewed by a national court. Erecting a new layer of federal court was criticized as unnecessary and too expensive. So the delegates compromised. And they compromised the way politicians often do, by kicking the can down the road. They said, we'll leave it to Congress to figure out later on to what extent lower federal courts are worthwhile, and that's what happened. So the Judiciary Act of 1789, and about 100 years later, the Circuit Court of Appeals Act in 1891, the Judges' Bill of 1925, and new, numerous other acts of Congress, fleshed out what we know as the modern federal court system. I'm not going to go into details this afternoon, but the important point is that consistent with the Founders' original conception, the jurisdictional space which the federal courts have come to occupy is but a sliver of the universe of judicial authority that is exercised in the United States today. The jurisdiction of federal courts is constitutionally limited. In marked contrast, the jurisdiction of state courts is plenary. There is virtually no dispute that state courts are not empowered to hear and decide. As a result, state courts, not the courts of the United States, serve as America's primary courts of record. My next point is this. State courts can handle more cases. State courts do handle more cases, as the dean said. The statistics bear this out. In size and number, the judiciaries of the several states dwarf the federal system. There are currently 874 authorized Article III federal judgeships. There are 531 full-time magistrate judges. Illinois alone has nearly 70% of that number, with 565 elected circuit judges, uh, uh, elected circuit, appellate, and Supreme Court judges, and another 390 associate judges. In 2015, the most recent uh, year for which we have statistics from both the federal government and Illinois, the combined filings for civil and criminal cases in all U.S. district courts in all parts of the country totaled 361,000. 689. In Illinois, the total court number of cases filed in all categories in that year was 2,707,414, nearly seven and a half times more. And that's just Illinois. Consider the 49 other states, Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, and Guam. And a few years ago, the Chief Justice of the Massachusetts Supreme Court reported that the number of new cases filed in state courts for that previous year totaled 48.5 million. You know, most people go a lifetime and probably or happily do so without ever setting foot in a federal courthouse. It would be unusual indeed to find someone who at one time or another has not had business of some sort uh, in a county courthouse. For most Americans in nearly every situation, the courts, state court system is where the real business of justice is done. And if you come from where I do, in the smaller counties, the county courthouse is located in the center of town on the square, and everybody has to go by it at some time or other. And uh, not only do you have courts, of course, you have the other county offices. <clears throat> My third point is uh, it's important to note that state courts are accessible. State courts themselves are acutely aware that we are the primary place people look to resolve disputes and obtain justice. In recognition of that obligation, the courts of Illinois and elsewhere have turned increased attention to making judicial services more accessible to those who need them. 
In a recent interview with the Chicago Daily Law Bulletin, the just retired U.S. Seventh Circuit Judge Richard Posner condemned the treatment of pro se litigants in his, uh, by his colleagues. He told the paper, and I quote, the basic thing is that most judges regard these people as kind of trash, not worth the time of a federal judge. I was going to tell a federal judge joke having to do with God and a federal judge, but everyone's heard that one, I think. The judges, <laughs> he, he thought he's a federal judge, yeah. The, uh, the judges of Illinois simply can't, and I'm being unfair to some federal judges. I worked for one who was a, just a great individual and a, and a scholar, and uh, most of that I know are. But that, that, was, a, that was kind of a, a reputation the federal court had for a while, and I think that's changing. But in Illinois, we can't afford to, to be that way. In 2015, 93 of Illinois' 102 counties reported that over 50% of civil cases filed there was a self-represented litigant, at least on one side. In certain types of cases, the number was as high as 80 percent. It's changing, and it's changing the way we have to do business, and that was part of our uh, discussion, uh, where our discussion was focused yesterday during the strategic planning uh, judicial conference. Now, poverty is probably the key driver of that. And if you've watched what's happening with funding the legal, of the Legal Services Corporation program, you know that there's probably no reasonable likelihood that legal aid will be able to reverse the trend of, of cutting funds. In Illinois, the Supreme Court, we believe, has responded by establishing a civil justice division within the administrative office and creating an access to justice commission. The Commission's guiding principles are, one, to provide users with plain language resources that will enable them to better understand and navigate the court system, to simplify the procedures and policies they must follow, to ensure that the court system operates as a fair, impartial, and transparent forum in which all users are treated with dignity and respect, and to ensure that all court users have equal access to, judici to judicial resources regardless of their socioeconomic status, English language proficiency, or cultural background. The Commission <coughs> excuse me, and our Civil Justice Division have been extremely busy formulating strategies and procedures to help achieve those objectives. Developing, they have been developing standardized forms, prof uh, professionalizing and expanding language translation services, implementing electronic filing, um, from remote locations, uh, any number of things, uh, including a justice corps that's going to the court buildings to help sometimes simply direct people to the courtroom, sometimes help them out uh, as to what they need to do. While there's a lot of work to be done, we're doing our best to ensure that when people seek justice, they will be able to find it in state court if nowhere else. Fourth, in a slightly different vein, state courts control who can practice law. And I, I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but uh, it's something that we all think about, especially you as law students, I would think. Uh, state courts decide who gets to be a lawyer, with limited exceptions for persons wishing to prosecute patent applications, non-attorneys who want to practice before the U.S. tax court. Uh, other than that, there's no federal admissions exam. To practice in federal court or to serve in the JAG Corps, and I just had a law clerk leave and go into the JAG program in the Navy, one must already have been admitted and be a member in good standing of the bar of the state of Illinois or one of the territories or possessions or of the District of Columbia. And it's, of course it is in the state courts that uh, have the ultimate uh, power over who can become a member of their respective bars, subject to the requirement of the First Amendment Admission and discipline of attorneys is vested in an area in the state of Illinois. We have the final say on who gets in. We also judge lawyers who must be let out. So for all practical purposes, the state courts are the gatekeepers of the profession. Speaking of which, Dean Hamar, I understand from my newest law clerk that um, Katie Campbell, who started with me this summer, and she came into the this is kind of a cute story. She lives about 35 miles from Nashville. She drives in every day. She got a call from her boyfriend while she was driving that he had gone online and saw that he had passed the bar. Well, she couldn't check while she was driving, so she said, I got to the first exit and I pulled over. I said, I passed the bar. <laughs> 
uh, and I came up here last uh, with my senior law clerk and, and uh, interviewed um, five or six students. They were all outstanding, but, uh, and Katie's doing an excellent job for me. So she's the class of 2017. She says that you promised to put up a plaque with the names of all the 2017 Illinois graduates if their pass rate was over 90%. You know, we offered that. And the class didn't want to do that because they weren't sure how they were going to do. And now that they did so well, they're kicking themselves. So. The first time takers from that class did 96%. That's outstanding. That is outstanding. Because the, the trend has been, it's been going down all over the state. Only one other university beat you, and that was Chicago with 99%. You beat Northwestern and all of the others. So my congratulations Thank to you. you. So she thought the plaque was going to be really big. But well, maybe, it's not going to. Well, maybe we'll, we'll revisit it. Okay. <laughs> uh, back to my topic. The fifth point is that uh, the jurisdiction of state courts is expansive. Their interpretive powers are broad and their decisions are largely beyond federal review. It seems to me that the real significance of the state court uh, derives the power from the rulings, and we see this in several ways. First, because the states of the United States are each sovereign powers, the decisions by state courts on questions of state law are absolute and cannot be overruled by any federal court under any circumstance. And I quote now, the highest state court is the final authority on state law, so said the United States Supreme Court in 1940. Thus, for example, neither a U.S. District Court nor the Seventh Circuit can tell us that we got our law wrong. Indeed, if a ruling by a state court rests on state law grounds that are independent of any federal question in a case, and the state law grounds are adequate to support the judgment, the state court ruling is not even re reviewable by the Supreme Court of the United States. And that's true whether it's on substantive or procedural bases. Moreover, litigants can't circumvent the binding effect of a state court's judgment by arguing that the court made a mistake in applying state law and that the mistake violated their rights to due process. So long as the judgment was rendered by a court of competent jurisdiction, federal courts cannot intervene. Outside of habeas corpus, if the loser in a state court proceeding attempts to attack the uh, judgment in federal courts on the grounds that the judgment somehow deprived it of a federally protected right, the federal court will have no subject matter jurisdiction to hear it under the Rooker-Feldman doctrine. If the loser tries to relitigate re in federal court to bypass the state court judgment, it's barred by race judicata. Because the overwhelming majority of civil disputes, civil and criminal disputes, are litigated in state courts, and because the overwhelming majority of those decisions turn on questions of state law rather than federal law, the net result is that virtually every decision by a state court is final once the state's appellate process is complete. My second point under that general fifth uh, division is that the binding and conclusive nature of state court pronouncements on questions of state law is not limited to cases litigated in state courts. When a matter, when a matter before a federal court is governed by state law, the federal court is required to follow the most recent pronouncement of that law by the state court. <clears throat> On questions of state law, federal courts must look to the state's highest court, the Supreme Court, first, but in the absence of any authoritative pronouncement from that court, they are obliged to give regard to decisions of the state's intermediate appellate courts as an indicia of how the state's highest court would decide the question. And if a federal court can't figure out how the state's highest court might rule, uh, they can certify that question to our court. We have the right to take the question and decide it, and we have the right to uh, not allow it. They can, the uh, state court can, uh, or the federal court, um, simply stops its case, sends us the question, how does that decide, or how, does, how do you interpret this law? Most um, states allow this, uh, as does Puerto Rico. Our procedure is governed by our rule, Supreme Court Rule uh, 20, and uh, we generally accept certified questions from the U.S. Supreme Court and from the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. 
I actually authorized the last one of those which we allowed just last year. It was called Zahn versus North American Power and Gas. The question there was a, a relatively simple question, but it, it had not been ruled on, and whether the Illinois Commerce Commission had exclusive jurisdiction over claims that were presented against ARIES, Alternative Residential Electric Suppliers, um, aside from Ameren or um, the, the large ones. And we said they did not have the exclusive jurisdiction. We answered the question, sent it back to the federal court, and they're going to decide on the claim. The important point I want to make here is that on questions of state law, federal courts must defer to the construction of the law followed by the courts of the state. They don't have the option of adopting their own interpretation, even if they think um, what we said makes no sense. Because of this, rulings of the state courts, particularly the highest court of the state, are not only dispositive of state court rulings or proceedings, they may also determine the outcome of proceedings in the federal court. There's another reason why state courts play a significant role under our constitutional order. Two of the reasons which I just discussed center on the dispositive power of state courts to rule on questions of state law. What is also significant however, and what I'll turn to now, is state court authority to hear and decide questions of federal law. As I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, when the Constitution was debated and enacted, state courts provided the basic framework for the exercise of judicial power. There were serious questions as to whether and to what extent courts were needed beyond the U.S. Supreme Court itself, and Congress ultimately resolved that um, question. But the reason the founders kicked the can down the road wasn't because they questioned whether there would be lawsuits involving federal action or federal law. Everyone knew there would be disputes involving issues of federal law that would, be, uh, would need to be resolved in court. The controversy was over whether you needed a separate federal court to hear such disputes or whether they could be adequately adjudicated by the state courts already in existence. Under the, cons the compromise that was worked out, the Constitution itself is indifferent as to whether a federal question should be decided in the first instance by a federal or a state court. The scheme adopted by the founders meant that unless and until a system of lower federal courts was set up by Congress, there was no place else to go but to the state courts to decide uh, whose uh, jurisdiction was plenary and didn't depend on the federal Constitution. So under our federal constitution, state courts are competent to adjudicate matters involving federal rights, absent some limitation imposed by Congress when establishing federal courts and defining their jurisdiction. Indeed, state courts are obligated to entertain federal claims unless they have a, federal, a valid reason for not doing so. The Supremacy Clause, of course, precludes state courts from denying enforcement of claims growing out of a federal a valid federal law. Where a federal question is involved in a state court proceeding, the state courts are bound only by rulings on federal law made by the United States Supreme Court. We're not even bound by uh, federal district courts or U.S. courts of appeal. We, can, we, do, we use those as saying it may be persuasive, and, but it's not, we're not bound by it. Federal courts exercise no appellate jurisdiction over state courts and decisions of the lower federal courts, as I said, are not binding upon us. In passing on federal constitutional questions, state courts and lower federal courts have the same responsibility and occupy the same position. Until the Supreme Court of the United States has spoken, the state courts are not precluded from exercising their own judgments on federal constitutional questions. Because lower courts exercise no appellate court jurisdiction over state courts, decisions of lower federal courts are not conclusive on state courts. <clears throat> we do, uh, we have had one professor at, I think it is John Marshall Law School in Chicago, who has a number of times suggested that we should adopt uh, uh, Tim, Tim, Tim Riley, I think his name is. Uh, we, should, we should rely on the Illinois Constitution more than on the federal Constitution because we could make our rulings immune from federal review. Um, and I'm going to get to a case in a little bit where that could have made a difference. 
While considerations of uniformity may militate in favor of our following federal precedent from the Seventh Circuit or from uh, other lower federal courts, we, we are free to depart from that precedent. Again, we're only bound by the um, U.S. Supreme Court decision. So when we render a decision, the likelihood of there being a change by the U.S. Supreme Court is low. In 2016, the U.S. Supreme Court heard only 17 cases coming out of state courts. Uh, during the October term 2014, it heard only five. So far this year, it has docketed only three. What this means as a practical matter is th that for litigants in the state courts of Illinois, the views of Illinois Supreme Court Justice Bob Thomas, my colleague, on issues of federal statutory and constitutional law are probably more important and will have a more immediate impact than the views of U.S. Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. My sixth point is that state courts have a, play a central role in construing state constitutions, which often provide legal protections independent of and in addition to those provided in the federal. <clears throat> I'm going to skip through some of this because it's a little repetitive. But of course, construing a state constitution is the prerogative of, uh, of, of the state and not the federal constitution. And um, the Supreme Court of the United States has said it's fundamental that state courts be left free and unfettered interpreting their own constitutions. Because of this, because the state constitution can confer greater protections than the federal, and because the Supreme Courts of the states are the final arbiters of the meaning of our con state constitution, it's clear that the state constitutional jurisprudence can be an important source of legal principles and protections completely separate and independent of those available under Illinois law. I think that was under federal law. Under federal law. The leading recent example of that in Illinois are probably in pension reform litigation and Kenerva versus Weems, both of which we decided in 2014 and 2015, having to do with the Pension Protection Clause of the Illinois Constitution, and in which we struck down certain legislation as violative of our Pension Protection Clause. And a few years ago, before that, before I was on the court in Jorgensen versus Blagojevich, which blocked the legislature, which would have eliminated cost of living adjustments, which are built into judicial salaries. Um, we. Uh, our court invalidated that on grounds that it violated a provision of the Illinois Constitution that prohibited the reduction of judicial salaries during a judge's term of office. <clears throat> we had a situation a few years ago when our Illinois Constitution provided for under uh, 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 Sixth Amendment rights, but the Illinois Constitution provided for a defendant having the right to meet the witnesses face to face. And it was a right we construed more broadly than the Confrontation Clause of the Sixth Amendment of the U U.S. Constitution. Um, the Constitution was amended, our Constitution was amended in 1994, making the state Constitution more consistent with the federal Constitution. So in many situations, the, our Constitution may actually be directly modeled on the language of the federal. In terms of abstract constitutional theory, there is no reason, even those situations, that state courts should not be entirely free to depart from U.S. Supreme Court's construction of analogous federal, federal provisions and decide that the terms of the state constitution mean something different than the federal. That seems especially true and makes sense if the U.S. Supreme Court's interpretation of the federal constitution has changed since a state constitution uh, was enacted. State constitutional guarantees, which once served as citizens' only protection against state action before the 14th Amendment led to making the Federal Bill of Rights applicable uh, against the states, uh, the constitutional guarantees would be surrendered to shifting winds of the federal judiciary if we didn't have the right to declare the meaning of our own constitution. And we wrestle with that problem. The approach we have hit upon when, uh, whenever we are construing provisions of the state constitution that are uh, similar to or analogous to the federal is a, a term called limited lockstep, which was announced by Justice Garman in her uh, majority opinion in People versus Cabayas. Cabayas is a case, it was a dog sniff case that went to the U.S. Supreme Court. 
um, and the the Supreme our Supreme Court um, adopted the opinion before I was on the uh, court and said that the search was invalid. The U.S. Supreme Court reversed it and sent it back. And so in, in rewriting it then, consistent with the federal constitution, we said our constitution means if it has the same language or virtually the same language, we're going to interpret that to mean the same thing as the federal constitution unless there are indications that the delegates to the convention or the application of the Constitution, uh, the committee debates, the reports, anything else that we could find that indicates the provisions of our Constitution should be, should be uh, interpreted differently. <clears throat> Another uh, a, a good example of when we, we interpret similar language differently is the case of Caicos versus Butler. Uh, that was the case that dealt with a recent amendment to our uh, right to a jury trial. There was legislation that changed the number of jurors from 12 to 6 in Illinois. We held that was unconstitutional because when our Constitution was adopted, the right to, the Constitution basically says the right to trial for jury shall not be infringed or changed as now heretofore enjoyed. Well, it was always a 12-person jury. The federal constitution has been interpreted six is okay, but we said no, it had to be 12. Okay, seventh, and we're getting close to the end now. States are an increasingly popular forum for litigating significant issues affecting personal rights. The robust nature of state constitutional jurisdiction will become even more significant as Litigants look to the state rather than to federal courts to resolve issues regarding import, important personal rights. Historically, most cr uh, criminal prosecutions take place in the state, not in federal courts. Uh, the Second Amendment def uh, defenses to firearm prosecutions seem to be a pretty active area in Illinois at the moment. We've had four or five cases where we've had to rule on those cases. We've also had some free speech rights come, uh, rising out of a uh, citizens can remember the term now take over Chicago or something like that what the right of free speech meant in that situation if there are any doubts that state courts can provide an effective venue for recognizing individual rights where the federal courts have declined to do so consider this case the infamous case of uh, George of, out of Georgia called Bowers versus Hardwick in 1986 the US Supreme Court said it upheld Georgia's sodomy law, holding that it did not, not violate the fundamental rights of gay men under the United States Constitution. As you may know, the case was ultimately overruled by the U.S. Supreme Court itself in 2003. What you may not know is that after the U.S. Supreme Court upheld the Georgia law against a federal constitutional challenge in Bowers, and five years before Bowers was overruled by the U.S. Supreme Court, the Georgia State Supreme Court struck down the same law on grounds that it violated the right, quote, to, uh, the right to be let alone guaranteed by Georgia's Constitution. So the state constitutional adjudication in that case resulted in positive change. Um, but after recent elections, the gerrymandering of legislative districts has become a hot topic. And of course, that's going on in the U.S. Supreme Court right now in Wisconsin's legislative uh, map. Um, in Illinois, there was an attempt made to address gerrymandering in a different way, and that was through uh, means of a ballot initiative. The proponents had enough signatures to get on the ballot. Everything was okay, but our Supreme Court in a four to three majority struck down the initiative on the grounds that it failed to comply with the Illinois state constitutional requirements. I would humbly submit the court's decision was completely wrong for the reasons detailed in a very well-reasoned lead opinion. I wrote the lead opinion, <laughs> uh, joined in by uh, two of my colleagues who um, forecast more uh, dire things that would happen. Um, I, I think what, what we said in those opinions, if that, if that didn't pass constitutional muster, what can? And how can there ever be a change uh, when the legislature has a personal interest in keeping the districts the way they want them. And finally, uh, just a very quick point, state courts and courts in general provide stability when other governmental institutions stumble. 
it's increasingly become a problem, especially here in Illinois, where the legislature and the executive branch have not been able to do their work. Uh, there were times during the budget stalemate when we had the feeling that uh, the legislature and the governor just um, decided to surrender the reins of government and let the courts decide who gets paid and when they get paid. And that's not our role. It should not be. Our job is to decide disputes, not manage the business of government. But we have to make sure that the government continues to run, that the institutions around us do not become completely unraveled. But courts don't have the power of the purse. We don't have the power to raise funds. We don't have the, the police power. We don't have the authority through the police to enforce our uh, judgments, our decrees. We have to rely on the trust of the people in our integrity, in our commitment to, to do the right thing without fear or favor. And finally, as we reflect on the past few weeks, uh, the hurricanes, the Las Vegas, the protests in St. Louis, and the, the disruption in normal life, that these events have brought. I think it's especially important for everyone who works in the court system to be mindful of the role we play in our orderly administration of justice. And that is our commitment to delivery of justice whenever and wherever it's needed. More than that, it's critical that we not only do justice, but that we leave the public with the firm percep perception that real justice is being done. I'm just a week shy of my first anniversary as Chief Justice of the Illinois Supreme Court. In that year, I've had the great opportunity to work directly with judges and court administrators and staff throughout the state of Illinois. They're outstanding individuals and utterly committed to serving the people of Illinois. I think that notwithstanding the problems with the legislature and the executive branch, the judicial branch is the one branch that still continues to function the way it was designed to. It's as if the other two branches in government said, uh, let's abandon ship, let's get out. We soldier on. I'm very proud to say that the judiciary is working as hard as it should and as it must, and in the end, that may be our most enduring legacy. I went a little longer than I expected. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. It's, it's been a pleasure, and I do have a few minutes. Do we have yeah, a few minutes?